day, Mr. Hutch here with you again to read chapter six titled Two Arms as we continue our follow along of the boys who challenged Hitler. All right, let's go ahead. As winter snows began to melt in the spring of 1942, another date to record down, the Churchill Club expanded into a force with nearly 20 members, active and passive. So remember, active members are going out and doing uh, the actual sabotage, but we have passive members like providing paint or distracting guards, things like that. Though they continued to seek out targets after school, they made more nighttime raids, mainly attacks on German vehicles conducted while they were supposedly playing bridge. One of the club's most important new active members was Ufa Darkett, whom Eigel had known from another school. So here's a new character to record down. When Eigel had transferred to cathedral school, he stayed in touch with Ufa and recommended him to the Churchill group. At first glance, no one would have taken Ufa for a saboteur, but he was always neatly dressed, for he was always neatly dressed, respectful and pleasant. His blonde good looks and steady manner inspired calm and trust, but like others, he was brave and dedicated and angry. He was quickly accepted. Perfect details to record down about that character. Knud and Jens Peterson took great pains to keep the Churchill Club secret from the rest of their family. The brothers knew that if their parents had any idea what was going on, they would move to stop it. In some ways, it wasn't that hard to a secret to keep. Their parents, Edvard and Margreta, were absorbed in their countless details of church work. Their younger sister, Gertrude, was no more interested in Jens and Knud's lives than they were in hers. Little brothers, Jorgen and Holger, were still in elementary school. So those aren't really main characters in our story. They're just siblings. And you can see they really laid that out right there for you. It helped that Jens's and Knud's uh, rooms, headquarters of the Churchill Club, were at the top of a staircase, isolated from the rest of the family's living quarters. During their meetings, the boys were careful to post a guard at Jens's door to make sure no one came upstairs. All in all, the Peterson parents were delighted their sons had made new friends so quickly after their move to Olborg. Uh, little do they know what they're up to, right? Uh, likewise, most cathedral school students had no idea what was going on. Knud Peterson would fight, a classmate later wrote. Soon he gathered from a class a bunch of boys around him. They went mostly around the schoolyard as a closed flock without the rest of us knowing why. Cathedral school faculty members continued to drill their students in preparation for midterm exams, unaware of the greater drama in which a few of their students were involved. Even as the club got more and more proficient at stealing weapons, they continued to try to manufacture their own explosives. The Churchill Club's professor, Moans Philrup, converted an elevator chamber on the monastery's second floor into a chemical laboratory. There he mixed combustible materials smuggled from cathedral school's chemistry classroom. In the beginning, they fizzled out again and again, but with each failure, the professor felt he was getting closer. Here's Knud Peterson speaking. Sometimes the whole second floor was thick with smoke and we had to run gagging to throw open the upstairs windows. The professor was trying to make a small hand make small handmade bombs to drop into the motors of parked German cars. For a while, they just went and we had to pry off the radiator screens and smash the engines with ordinary tools. But the professor kept at it. He was the silent type who only gave a faint smile when the rest of us were doubling over with laughter. We made up our operations as we went along, sometimes taking chances that shouldn't have we shouldn't have taken. But we had no formal command structure. We were too jealous of each other to name or elect a leader. We belittled each other. The professor reddened when Eigel insisted his bombs didn't qualify him for full Churchill Club membership. He had to steal a gun like everyone else. Others piled on. Yeah, your bombs never work anyway. What a mastermind. The sarcasm was thick as the monastery walls, but we had faith in each other and our mission held us together. We were out to install Norwegian conditions. So this is the second time they've mentioned that, Norwegian conditions. What they mean by that uh, is that they have a vision of what uh, Norway went through when they fought back, and they want to show that same kind of pride in protecting their country in fighting back. The courage to resist, they say, in our country. 
Denmark would stand whether the government liked it or not. Several times a week, we met in Jens's room, took a roll, and then went out on our bikes. We divided the city into quadrants and scouted, sometimes in pairs and sometimes alone. We inspected the parked German vehicles and buzzed by the Wehrnacht offices, searching the German assets to destroy and weapons to steal. Sometimes we came up empty. Usually there was something. During one of these routine reconnaissance missions, I drifted past a German barracks and saw something that made my eyes nearly popped out of my head. It was almost too good to be true. I stood up from my bicycle seat and mashed down the pedals, tearing around town, rounding up the others and telling them to get back to the monastery at once. Within minutes, we were on Jens's couch, the Borges tobacco glowing in our bowls, a chair wedged against the door, and all eyes on me. So what's the big deal? came the question. Big deal is, I found a lovely German rifle dangling from a bedpost inside a barracks bedroom. The window is wide open. It's ours for the taking. Now's our chance. There was unanimous agreement. We had to have it. Let's wait for the night, someone said. But the rest of us knew we had to move now, in broad daylight. The streets would be crowded, providing cover. The building was unguarded, or at least it had been an hour ago. At night, there would be a German on that bed. Now, there was only a rifle. No, we would make a daylight strike, but if we were able to snatch the rifle, we would have to conceal it as we transported it back to the monastery. A Danish boy couldn't just be seen cheerfully pedding, pedaling down uh, a Wehrmacht-filled Olborg street with a German rifle slung over his shoulder, so we had to make one plan for capturing it and another one for moving it. Our operation called for three boys and a raincoat. It was about three o'clock when Borga, Mons Thompson, and I reached the barracks. We circled the block a couple times just to see how traffic was moving and to make sure that there were no German guards posted. It was still clear. On the third lap, Mons let himself fall behind a little while Borga and I advanced. With Borga carrying the coat close to the barracks, we ditched the bikes behind a tree. The barracks building was enclosed by a barbed wire fence, but the strands were widely separated and easy to step through. I held the fence open for Borga, then let myself in and walked slowly toward the window. The rifle was still there, dangling on a belt from the post of an empty bed. But in the next room, his back to us was a German soldier, busily polishing his windows with a rag. He hadn't seen us yet. We froze in place and waited for our hearts to calm down. Then we exchanged nods. I made my move. I slipped to the corner of the building, inched to the window, and reached inside for the rifle. I wrapped my hand around it, snatched it off the bedpost, and passed it out to Borga. The weapon was almost as long as he, but Borga got it bundled up inside the coat and began walking away. Not running, just an even stride. As I backed away, I could hear the German next door, still rattling the room with the fury of his window washing. In a flash, we were back over the fence, and Moans had the rifle wrapped in, his ra in the raincoat on his bike. A postman and two women stood on the street, staring at us as we took off. I met one of the women's eyes. They told me she had seen the whole thing. She appeared conflicted. Would they start yelling or hold their tongues? We didn't hang around to plead our case, but we didn't hear any kind of alarm behind us as we rode away. We took narrow streets back to the monastery. Again and again, Moans had to stop to readjust the coat because both ends of the rifle kept sticking out. When the monastery came into sight, we whistled our arrival, threw the bikes against the gate, and ran the bundle inside. We lowered the coat onto Jens's bed and unwrapped our prize. It was a beautiful rifle, the stock polished, the barrel clean. Now we had a significant weapon, a long-range killing machine. We had to sort out what it meant, but not right now. The three of us were exhausted. We called a meeting for the following afternoon. It would be the most important yet. All right, little setting change here, time, time change. The Churchill Club had full attendance the next day. The meeting began with a detailed report of the rifle's liberation. A uh, good vocabulary word to write down, liberation. From the window-washing Nazi to the witnesses, everyone got to hold the weapon, look down its barrel, barrel, feel the balance weight of the deadly machine, and imagine a Nazi within its sights. All the boys shared in the satisfaction that at least one good weapon had changed sides of the ledger. Then the discussion became more serious. They show a picture of the barracks of a 
Danish Volunteer Army Corps that assisted the German army with guard duty and sabotage prevention. All right, here's Knud Peterson speaking. We had done something differently yesterday, more significant than anything we'd done yet. Yes, the pistol we'd stolen from the German car downtown was important, but a pistol offers only a few shots at close range. A rifle would let us snipe to attack or, or cover each other from long distance. We had reached a crossroads. The question before us was, should we continue along the same path, defacing and destroying German property, or should the main job of a Churchill clubber now be to build a cache of weapons and train ourselves to use them against our German occupiers. To choose a ladder would mean that we would cease to burn their cars and buildings, but our new emphasis would be weapons. Hmm. Wonder what you think they should do. It was a spirited discussion with everyone joining in except the professor, who rarely said anything. But in the end, we agreed that if our goal was to awaken Denmark, we must get weapons. And as our operations increased in scale and complexity, we would need firepower to cover each other. Finally, if the war turned in our favor and British troops came to liberate us from Germany's grasp, wouldn't it be great to have weapons to share with British troops on the day their fighting forces arrived to liberate us? With weapons, we would be able to fight side by side with our allies. In the end, we were one heart. In the words of the French national anthem, Och arms citizens, to armed citizens, weapons, we must get weapons. But where to find them? One kid proposed that if we kept riding around, other weapons would appear. Look what has just happened for Canute, he said. Another countered with another story about a small boy who had found a dead bird. He buried the bird, proud of himself, made a cemetery for more dead birds. Then he went out to find others, but he couldn't. Finding the first bird had been a one-time event, a stroke of happenstance and luck. The point of the story was, I was wondering the same thing myself, what's the point? The point of the story was that if we were to develop an arsenal of weapons, we couldn't just rely on luck. We had to think strategically about where German weapons were concentrated and how to get them. We made a list of the most likely German gathering places where weapons might be lifted. There were always German officers in the pastry shops downtown. The train stations were good for ammunition boxes. The waterfront teemed with armed soldiers. And now that the weather was warming and windows were likely to be open, a regular inspection of German barracks would be a must. We composed the next day's patrols and adjourned our meeting to go home and study for our midterm examinations. Oh yeah, they're still doing school and stuff <laughs> as we're going through this story. All right, they show a picture of parading German soldiers. And that is the end of our chapter. Uh, I'll see you next time for chapter seven.